In this video, I want to be talking about how to deal with witchcraft as well as evil altars. I think a lot of Christians uh, haven't have a grasp around all of this. There's a lot on the internet concerning witchcraft and evil altars and Christians doing this and that. I'll start off with a simple story that I heard from Lester Semral. Lester Semral is very successful when it comes to the ministry of deliverance. Uh, the type of context of deliverance I'll be talking about is specifically the casting out of demons. Though I remember that I made a video to you that deliverance doesn't only constitute the casting out of demons. Lester Samuel was very successful in casting out of demons. So his strategy of casting out of demons is one of the things that I learned earlier in my life. I looked at how and what he did spiritually and then I began to employ it in order to not... Uh, struggled with demons so he was uh, a very epitome he was epitome in terms of how i learned to cast out demons lester samuel there is a story that is said by rod parsley who is still alive to this day how that in one crusade lester samuel had about 1000 people manifesting demonically like 1000 people and within split seconds like within five to three seconds he was able to cast all of those demons out of all those people like instantly without even struggling so this guy was very successful in this ministry some of you must have heard might have heard the story of how he delivered a girl on the Philly on the philippines who was so possessed to a point that magazines and newspapers sought out people who would set her free she would just curse people and they would die within three days that lady so how that lester samuel was able to cast out that demon so i'm going to be talking about a story that he narrated in this story he spoke about a girl this girl was a missionary coming out of the united states she was about the age of 16 years no experience she was newly born again newly saved so this young lady went out to preach to some of these native people in america she went to this specific tribe so when she went to this tribe she began to preach jesus because she had this passion of fire you know when we get saved how that we have this passion of fire to just go around preaching and then she went and preached and then when she was preaching people were converted you know and then uh going out for this jesus who are they hearing for the first time from this girl who's 16 years and then lester samuel speaks of how that there was a native witchcraft or maybe native native witch doctor this guy now realized that the girl was beginning to be a threat and then he went out to challenge her openly and then they would prove which god is greater and now the villagers were well aware of the power that this guy possessed they were afraid of him apparently the girl um Concerted, and then she was willing to go out to this open contest to prove this, you know, challenge to prove which God is the greater. Lesser Samuel, this is a true story. Now, Lesser Samuel goes on to uh, mention how that the villagers were all available in this day so they were around them so this girl would show up, demonstrate the power of this Jesus, this witch would do the same. So the witch came to this girl and said, so who starts is it me or you now mind you according to the story of lesser samral the girl had not much of an experience not much of bible study she has not been too much of studying the bible maybe like she was saved one year saved so you would consider her a baby in christ she doesn't know much but what she knows she began to share christ with people in that village and the story goes that the witch doctor challenged her and said who begins do i go first or do you go first and the girl said you go first and lester samral then mentions that this was the first mistake she made so the witch doctor therefore sets out to go into the uh the middle of this uh you know place because every People were actually around this specific area that he chose this witch doctor to challenge this girl. And then he kind of uh, slept, you know, like he lied down actually. He lied down in this center. And then when he lied down, in about three to four minutes, this guy's body turned out to be as solid as a plank, you know, solid as a brick. And then the girl saw something she never saw before in her life the this uh you know uh date like dead dry body 
solid uh, dry body if i could name it that began to levitate to about a knee size like a supernatural power caused this guy's body to levitate and when he was levitating people were in awe and then the young girl now began out of nowhere to be stressed will i demonstrate because in the scriptures we are never uh, given anything to demonstrate in terms of trying to prove to people if jesus is there or not immediately when the young lady was thinking about this she set her mind on christ and then she had no experience prior to this at that moment she felt a sudden urge something prompting her heart she didn't know how to follow god the voice of god or anything but she felt a prompt in her heart this prompt was like prompting her to walk up to that uh, native doctors or witch's uh, body that was levitating this thing kept on insisting because the levitation kind of took some time the levitating and then it kept on insisting and then until to a point the girl began to follow this prompt when she followed this prompt she went closer to this body and the prompt uh, began to prompt her now to set out place a foot on top of this body and then the girl did as that she placed a, she didn't even know what she was doing she was never taught of how to follow god how god speaks how god leads so she was just experiencing something she's never seen in her life for the first time so she laid out one foot on top of this levitating body of the switch immediately the witch began to manifest the body went the body fell back down to the ground and then this witch began to manifest manifest and immediately the girl knew now what to do and she said satan i command you to come out of his body immediately all the demons in that witch doctor left he was set free in front of all the villagers true story and the beautiful part is that the guy said you know i've never seen such power in my life and then received jesus so by this she began to win all the entire village and even the people who were skeptics of christ's power now my point that i'm trying to show you is this here's a girl who's 16 she's been saved for maybe a few months or at least a year she knew nothing about bible style or stuff but when she had the message of jesus she felt that she should be missionary to go to people who've never heard the gospel these native people and then begin to minister to them and then from this on she began to experience the power of god now contrary to what most people have in their minds or what teachers or african bible teachers teach or even some uh, from different parts of the world that before i got power from god i fasted 40 days you know i used to pray one hour every day for 30 days you know i used to actually uh, fellowship with god for eight hours each day this is how i got the power here's a girl that only knew how to speak in tongues that's the only thing she knew and when she knew that she knew how to actually cast out a demon based on being uh, led by the lord no experience never prayed an hour before in her life maybe let's say i don't know maybe uh, but she's never spent even hundreds of hours in a bible study you know but that is the one thing we can know about her so my point in telling you this is this as believers we have these uh, ideas that do not uh, exist this lie or fantasy in the spirit that you think that in order for god to move or use you you've gotta pray you've gotta fast a lot no my pastor usually said that god is full of anointing he is only short of vessels the only thing god needs it's a it's, it's only a yielded vessel like this girl not knowing anything no prior experience to this but she was able to bring christ to a village and conquer a well powerful known witch in the area my point therefore i'm talking to you about how to deal with witchcraft here's the first thing that i'll tell you there's four ranks of demons the lowest level is what is called powers from powers we move to principalities from principalities we go to the higher rank which is rulers of the darkness of this world and then the highest dimension of demonology in the studies of demonology spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places so the lowest dimension is called powers what are powers these are demons that are responsible to giving witches sangomas spiritual spiritual or supernatural powers for a good example a lot of people just think that we are against a sangomas because they are uh, you know african medical uh, you know medical or herbalists 
that is not the entire truth let me tell you something there is not even a single herb that leaves a sangoma without it actually being introduced or inviting a spirit to eat they would be in paper and then they speak to the spirits to invoke the power of the spirits to this medicine and then they send it to someone because come on think of it you can take any medicine and throw it to someone nothing will happen so why does particular uh, mutis when they are mixed throw to people they are able to kill people it's because the spirits behind them so my point is that the spirits behind all these are the spirits that are called powers these are the lowest type of demons they have the least amount of sense on their own they do nothing from their own capacity everything they do they are told by the second ruling rank of demons which is called principalities they have less thinking on their own they are dumb stupid spirits i can call that but they are powers because they have power so they are the ones behind magicians where you see specific i'm not talking about illusionists I'm talking about magicians these are powers so magicians have a specific covenant with them as well as specific uh, you know uh, specific sangomas in fact sangomas have also covenants with them as well as some people that tend to use witchcraft have covenants with these spirits the powers this is how powers function you come into a place in your life where you hear Guti, there's a place that is tormented by a specific ghost every night you hear that in this house you know dishes fall and then they levitate at night and then you'd hear screams and voices those are powers these demons are the lowest level they have the lowest type of intelligence in the spiritual realm but now think of this you can never uh, equate the intelligence of spirits with humans it's higher than humans though it's lower in the spiritual realm so the word demons according to dr meral f anger comes from the greek word which was anciently used during the times of bob lutak to mean daemon daemon sorry which means in the greek uh which in the Greek actually speaks of knowledge. So you're talking about uh, not just things, but spirits that have knowledge. What do I mean by knowledge? They have knowledge about human lives, the world is how things operate on earth and everything. As much as they are lower in intelligence, powers, they are told everything they need to do by principalities but they are more intelligent in that they know everything about human lives about people's lives about the families they torment they know about uh, every uh, 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 inform they have information about each and every individual and how things work in the natural world they have that knowledge in them it's innate this uh, spirits so these are the spirits that are involved in witchcraft whether you're talking about dogoloshi these uh, you know small things like uh, these elves these elves that are sent or they send out uh, to torment people whether you're talking about armor boys there's different types of entities that are used in witchcraft all of these ones fall under the class which is called powers whether you speak about spiritual husbands they fall under pa this uh, they fall in this rank called powers now these are the lowest type of demons they don't need any person to actually stress more about them here's the key thing that i will teach you about spirits and demons how they function demons the advantage they have about humans is that they can see through you what i mean by that how does one cast out demons like this young girl who cast out demons out of a famous witch very powerful witch the ability for her to cast out demons had nothing to do with a prayer i like the fact that lester samran one thing i forgot to mention is that the girl didn't even spend time preparing for this day she took it lightly you know because she's never co been confronted with such an experience before when someone would have just stayed prayed and then prepared herself so she never did any of that she was a young girl naive in everything but when she got there god stepped in and then god proved himself you know on her behalf and then she was able to deliver that witch doctor the point that i want to draw your attention on which is also important it is that she didn't even prepare herself for this how did how was she able then without hours spent in prayer without you know hours spent in fasting cast out this demon uh, cast out these demons and set free this witch who's so powerful the ability for her to flow in this it is through her identity have you realized that each time jesus cast out devils it had to do with his identity not what he did not that he prayed the entire night and to make this very simple for you picture it this way do jesus 
he didn't cast out devils when he was 12 he didn't cast out devils when he was three years he didn't cast out devils when he was 15 although he was god remember when he came on earth he stripped himself off of being god in order to step and be 100 percent human yes we know that by his in his spirit he was still 100 percent man god sorry though in his body he was 100 percent man so jesus never cast out any devils all that time until after he was baptized by john the bible tells us the holy spirit came upon him then that is when the spirit led him to the wilderness he began to cast out devils set the oppressed free do miracles and all of that so god himself had to depend on his power which is god the holy spirit to flow you know he had to depend on that he didn't just you know just do these things because it was God naturally. So my point in telling you this is this. Jesus cast out devils firstly because of who he is and secondly by the spirit of God. He even says in Matthew 12 that he cast out devils by the spirit of God. So that is the only thing you need. So each time whether Luke 8, whether Matthew 8 when he was faced with a demon, this demon would cry, I know who you are, thou son of God. Whether it was a principality, a power, all demons can actually uh, identify when a person is saved we have a specific uh, aura in the spirit we have a specific aura you know we have a specific uh, aura around us a specific glory that demons can see uh, they can know when a person is born again they can know that is who they are hence when they met jesus they said you are the son of god they knew so jesus ability to cast out demons was who he is your identity so your ability to cast out devils is who you are not when you pray not when you fast he said jesus these are the signs that shall follow them that believe in my name they will cast out devils so it's who you are in christ because when you're in christ you are severed you are a uh, move from the kingdom of darkness to god's kingdom so because you're in god's kingdom you have power over the kingdom of darkness so you can cast and command demons that is because of who you are it's your identity so demons will say i know who you are and then remember the sons of skiva we know paul who you you speak of we know jesus but who who are you they were not saved but if you are saved so this is not a thing to say there's ranks in the spirit i'm against that preaching one day i shall make a video uh, speaking out against it because it's unbiblical there's no ranks in the spirit we are sent to be apostles this is not a spiritual rank it's a spiritual assignment calling not a rank it doesn't mean there are people who are ranking higher in the spiritual realm no 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 that, that there's no such thing as long as you are saved, Jesus says, believers, not apostles, not prophets, in my name shall cast out devils. So the problem with many believers is that I said to you the word demon in the uh, ancient Greek, it means uh, intelligent. It means spirits with intelligent, intelligence. So when we come as believers, we have fear. We don't know our identity. They can see through us and they can manipulate that. Just recently, I was speaking to a specific lady who's having everything falling aside in her life. And by this, she's saying, I'm doing everything right, but I just don't know why. The reason being, I began to make her to say, how much time do you spend in the world? only to find that it's zero now here's what i'm saying to you you can pray as much as you like but if you don't have the weight inside of you you don't have the consciousness of your identity which makes demons to fear and tremble when you come around them it's based on your identity now the amount of the weight you have in you it is directly proportional to the amount of the sense of authority you have in you never grow in authority like praying then you have more authority authority is authority the king's son is more as powerful as the father the king is because he is a royalty by birth it has nothing to do with whether he prays whether he goes to the gym whether he exercises whether he studies a lot no he can be a dumb king because of the authority he is born into so as a child of god you are born into authority this is who you are so therefore many people because they don't have the word in them demons can see through so the ability to cast out devils or to even exercise in miracles is also directly proportional to boldness hence the bible says the believers begin to say god grant us more boldness how does boldness comes it comes with the sense and the awareness the consciousness of your authority as well as how uh, as well as the ability to speak in tongues the holy spirit when it comes into speaking in tongues you have therefore boldness now, I'm not saying that people who cannot speak in tongues who are saved cannot cast out devils. That is not true. 
they are illegible and they can cast out devils because of who they are and because of the name of Jesus. Simply as that. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people now when they come and then they pray, you find Christians today, they want methods around witchcraft. For example, someone has been tormented by witchcraft. A lot of us Africans, based on, I think it has to do with our environment and how we were raised. We feel, you tell a person to say, just command that situation to leave. People feel like, mm, you know, this is not really satisfying. The man of God, the man of God is unwilling to help. Because a lot of Africans believe you have to because a lot of Africans believe that you have to tell them to fast seven days after seven days you tell them to pray the secret prayer and then after the secret prayer you tell them to stand in the door look in that direction and then command the spirit and then they, and then our people feel because of effort God is eligible to move now come on Jesus defeated the devil he he did everything that should have been done with our sicknesses, with poverty, with the devil. You realize that Jesus did everything he could do to set us free from all these things. Therefore, now we are only using the victory he has given us. So we are not speaking out of to try to we are not speaking from a point of trying to gain victory. So we're speaking from a level of victory because we have attained it in Christ. So a lot of Christians are so conscious of witchcraft. According to God's uh, point and according to God's, uh, uh, God's will, God intended that not any Christian could be bewitched. That is God's intention. That believers cannot be bewitched. They cannot be cursed because of who we are. So uh, he said to Abraham, whoever curses you, the curse will bounce back to them whoever blesses you the blessing will bounce back to them so if you're a believer you are when god spoke these things you were in abraham through the spirit so the bible says we are the seed of abraham the promises that were made to him the bible says so that they may come to us through the promise of the spirit therefore which means anyone that curses you as a believer you don't have to go back and curse them forgive them but whoever kisses you those things go back to them they bounce back to them it's like taking a tennis ball and hitting it against the wall the harder they hit the harder it bounces back so when they kiss you they come back to them when they bewitch you these things die out when they come to your point so many of you will be like but i was bewitched before and i'm a christian that has to do with your consciousness what are you conscious of are you a believer who believes you can be bewitched then you will go into experience witchcraft are you a believer who believes that you are victorious you cannot be wished then you're going to experience that the key to operate in anything spiritually it is to have the consciousness of it let me show you another good example of what i'm saying here if you are a believer you always confess every morning and you say that i'm victorious i'm above i'm not beneath i am beyond you confess you confess that every day it comes to a point where it's conscious and when it's conscious it's in your spirit it fills your spirit so much with that aura to a point that your mind is tuned into it and then it becomes a reality around you having to hurt the people of the world to say that the more you have negative thoughts the more you attract negative things the more you have positive thoughts the more you attract positive things they have an idea of the spiritual world better than christians in this so what i mean is if you feel what you can be bewitched as a christian i think the ministry you're going to or the people you're listening into are really affecting your faith they're giving you the wrong type of faith the bible says in the book of numbers 23 23 that there is no enchantment which means there is no curse which means there is no muti that can succeed against the chosen people uh, back then it spoke to israel so but now we know what it, it speaks it actually spoke to us who is the spiritual israel i'm not speaking about i'm not advocating anti-semitism by this so which means therefore that any witchcraft is not supposed to succeed to you because you're a believer you don't have to pray for god God's promises if God promised it the only way to activate a promise it is to appreciate and receive it you don't have to pray over it there was a time when I had I was with a specific brother and we were praying and then he wanted uh, me to help him pray because he was about to take a journey to the instant Cape and then I said to him you know you are not supposed to pray for God's protection when you go uh, even if it's a long distance even if you go for a long distance or short distance you are not supposed to pray to God and say God protect me in the journey 
So you don't have to pray when something is a promise. The Bible says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. When it says the curse of the law, it means that the curse is not for us, but the blessings of the law are for us. The blessings that were spoken by Moses are for us, but the curses that come to not keeping the law, Christ redeemed us from that. That's what the Bible says. So which means every blessing in the law is the blessing of God. The greatest strategy of Satan that I have seen that he's doing today, it is telling people that not all the entire Bible is the word of God. There's the word of God and there's not the word of God. I am of those who say the Bible is the word of God. Why? This is not my last time speaking this testimony. I had a lady at church who found that she was pregnant. And having found herself that she was pregnant, this is something that took place about three to four years ago. Then she went to the doctor to check. And then the doctor checked and then found that there's a lamp. I love the story. It's a story of great faith. The doctor checked and found that there's a lamp inside of her belly. And the lamp is growing uh, in the same place with the baby. And then referred her to another doctor, set out a date. When she was leaving, she said she felt devastated. The first thing she thought of was to call me, you know, as a pastor. And at that point, she suddenly knew what I would do. And it's true, I would exactly do that. Because she knows how I teach them at church, you know. And then she went home. When she went home, she wrote down scriptures of healing. She confessed to them. When that date came for her to go to that second door, she didn't even tell anyone at church because I had taught them faith. So she instead spoke to the situation and then began to confess healing scriptures. This is the attack that the devil is bringing to the church today to say the word of God is not the word of God. Therefore, these will take people away from such experiences to believe that the word is anointed and that people can be healed from it because it's not the word of God. That's what the devil is saying today. Through uh, pastors, more able damina coming to say not every portion of the scripture is the word of God. I am against that. I'm one of those who says the word of God. The Bible is the word of of God. I don't care whether the statements of Satan there, God wrote them for us to learn something even if we don't have inspiration from there. But the Bible says all scripture is God breathed. Now my point is she confessed, she confessed. When she went to the second doctor for a checkup, the doctor viewed her and then after viewing her for over 40 minutes she says and there were people be, uh, behind and she was like in the queue sorry and then she was like to the doctor, doctor you're taking so much time on me and there's people and the doctor says I don't understand because the reports says this year but i see nothing and she says yes there's nothing because my god healed me the doctor couldn't understand and then she went out praising god she gave birth to a very healthy daughter who's still healthy to this day and she's never had that situation now it's after i think now it's after four years uh, close to five years after that experience now my point is this a lot of people in the church today there's what we call great faith and little faith a lot of people believe it has to be my pastor to pray for me my pastor when he prays for me everything will go good that is not great faith jesus says great faith is when people can take him at his word remember the centurion who said you are not worthy to come into my house speak a word so therefore the bible says he has sent his word and delivered them of their sicknesses to this day jesus has sent his word he has delivered you from every affliction without you even wanting me to pray for you just sit down put down all the healing scriptures and command the situation to leave you after you command that situation to leave you don't ask god don't beg god don't cry to god tell it and after you tell it to leave in jesus name Put down healing scriptures, confess them, speak them up, and then you'll see victory because it's a promise that he'll take care of you. And then you might begin with doubt first in your mind because as a child of God, we don't struggle from faith. Why? Because when you were born again, you were born again into a family of faith. Therefore, this means when you were born again into a family of faith, you were born into faith. The Bible says God, when you were born again, he gave you a portion or a measure of faith. Every believer has a measure of faith. It's up to you to grow it. But do you know that that small faith, you can use it to move mountains? Jesus says, as small as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. It's just believers were never taught how to use even small faith. Now, I am telling you this, just by you studying out, confessing those healing scriptures, even if you have doubt in your mind, 
It's a matter of time before that word catches up with your spirit because you're confessing it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you speak these words, they also come into your ears and they build faith in you. Suddenly one day you will roar and the situation is gone. You cannot just come to God and say, God protect me in the journey as I'm about to leave, as I'm about to take a taxi or what. No, you cannot. That is unbelief. It's not without faith. You have faith in your spirit. You need to grow it. So, But when you're walking out of the word of God, you're walking in unbelief. It's not that you don't have faith. You have faith, but you need to grow it through uh, listening to the word of God, uh, reading, studying the word of God. That's how you grow your faith. That's how you grow your faith. But now, you cannot just say, God, uh, protect me as I'm about to go. He promised you that. So the only thing you need to, how to appropriate that is to thank him. You can just say, God, as I'm about to leave, take a, a long journey. I thank you that you said, blessed, uh, blessed am I when I go out and blessed I am when I come in. And you have promised me protection in Psalm 90. So you just thank God and you say, thank you for the protection. Even over your children, you lay hands on them. You say, God, thank you for the protection over my children as they travel. That's how you appropriate promises. You don't need to command God because he promised you. You have to thank him for that. That's how you appropriate them. In the same manner, many people now are demonic conscious. Believers are going all over trying to bind this demon, you know, fight that witchcraft, every witchcraft set against them, let it bend back. No, you don't have to do that. You simply, if you're struggling with believing God that you're protected from witchcraft, begin a 30-day journey, a 30-day experience of every day or maybe three times a day affirming and say, God, thank you that you said in Numbers 23 and 23, no witchcraft shall prevail against me. Thank God every day. Speak it until you become conscious of it and you'll see miracles after that. And now let's talk about evil altars. The word altars, many people take it from Genesis. In Genesis, we know when Abraham stepped in Beersheba by created an altar, uh, you know, Jacob, Jacob and Bethan and altar so to make a monument and a remembrance everywhere where they went but you have to understand that people in the Old Testament some people even believe that you need to have an altar in the New Testament in your own home or house now let's look at this in the Old Testament the presence of God was in a few selected people the presence of God was upon kings who anointed into the office prophets uh, you know and a specific lay people but the rest of the people didn't have the presence. So people, whenever they needed the presence of God, they had to go to a specific place. When Jerusalem was built, they stopped going to altars and then they focused into Jerusalem. Unless when an angel of the Lord appeared in a specific place, then they would make an altar like in the case of Gideon to commemorate that place and that experience. Because the presence of God was not everywhere. But in the New Testament, when you putting a place and then you putting an altar, you say, this is my altar of prayer. You are limiting God because today your, the Holy of Holies of God is in your spirit. That is where God resides. He dwells in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. You are the Holy of Holies. You are the temple of God. So you are the person that actually now uh, walks with God. You have God in you. You don't need an altar. God doesn't dwell in specific places. Teach yourself, therefore, or exercise the consciousness that God can begin to flow through you even though you are in the supermarket, even though you are at church or you are at work, that God can flow through you. You can prophesy to people wherever you are. You can begin to minister to people wherever you are. You can set the sick free wherever you are so that your altar, teach your spirit, Teach your mind that your altar is not at home. Wherever you are, that's, you can be the altar of God so that you have this mind that is actually a uh, limitless to believe that you are having the uh, omnipresence of God anywhere, at any place, whenever, so that you don't have God fixated in a particular place. Teach yourself that. Talking about evil altars, you don't need to go about saying, I destroy evil altars against my name. Hey, you're a child of God. Witchcraft is not supposed to work on you. Begin to confess that if you doubt that. For 30 days, maybe three times a day, that no evil altar will work in my life because I'm a child 
child of God. And God says that he has protected me from witchcraft. Numbers 23, 23. And begin to speak that word. Put on scriptures that speak of God's provision, healing, a deliverance, liberty over your life and healing and health, divine health. How that you can never be witch. Speak those things until they become conscious in your life. Stop stop creating prayers you or maybe uh, operating in dimensions you are not orchestrated to operate in stop flowing into places you are not jurisdicted jurisdicated to function in like for example saying i destroy evil altars you will open yourself up to a whole lot of can of worms you will open yourself up to an offensive attack of the enemy because we are praying in places that god did not sanction for you to pray in there is no verse in the bible that says pray against evil altars so don't do that because because god said to you because god didn't say to you pray against evil altars it means therefore that he knows the future and the past he knew that people will set altars against you it means that those things are taken care of learn to trust god and rest in his promises and rest in him instead of trying to toil toil this place is a place of rest the bible says that where the spirit of the lord is is liberty many people i'll be closing with this have this consciousness for example i was talking with my sister the other day she reminded me this people will be hearing devil worshippers saying that we fasted 40 days to get that man of god because we wanted to destroy his life so we fasted 40 days and then when we hear these testimonies of people who have converted from being devil worshippers we say hey christians are playing i need to pray i need to fast i need to do that my pastor one of the pastors submitted and i had a tendency to actually speak about comparing us with uh, the kingdom of darkness sometimes they would say you know uh, they know the amount of sacrifice they know how to sacrifice you know for us christians we don't know how to sacrifice financially that was manipulation and on top of that let me tell you this you can never compare these two kingdoms one is of the devil one is of god one works by the spirit and the law of love it's god's kingdom the one of the enemy works by the law of of fear and bondage so these people were abused in here in the kingdom of god there is rest those ones were abused in the kingdom of darkness so in the kingdom of god there is liberty the bible says they that believe have entered into his rest you rest here if you're fasting you're fasting out of victory if you are praying you are praying out of victory you are not praying to try to gain victory so we are living in rest this is a place of rest not of toil of struggle this is god's kingdom bless you do not forget to like and to subscribe